All right, first of all, you know, Bernice, you had a question last week about the trumpets. Uh -huh, yes. Well, I found out the answer to that. Uh -huh, yes. yes. So first I'm going to read a little bit out of this book, Thus Shalt Thou Serve by C.W. Slemming. It's a great little book. It tells all about the feasts and the offerings. This is what it says about the trumpets. Two trumpets were always in use. These are described in the book of Numbers. Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the assembly and for directing the movement of the camps. That's Numbers 10, 2. In later years, however, and at the present time, ram's horns were used called shofars. And then another thing about the Feast of Tabernacles was that sometimes they call it the Feast of Booths. I'll read you just real quick in Leviticus 23, 40 through 43, what it tells about that. And you shall take you on the first day the bows of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the bows of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelite shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So that's how this feast came to be. So now I'm going to start where I left off last week, and that is the Gospel of John chapter 7, and I'm going to start at verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, isn't this he who they seek to kill? So what it kind of tells you right there is that some of the people knew about that plot. Mm -hmm. But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that he is the very Christ? So some people know that he is the Christ. And they were expecting a Christ at this time. So they're going, this is it. It's happening. Howbeit, we know this man from where he is. But when Christ comes, no man knoweth from where he comes. So now some people are doubting, and you're going to see this a lot in this reading right here, because they think he was born in Galilee. You know, if just one person would have asked him, where are you born? He could have told him. I was born in Bethlehem. But nobody asked him. They just assumed. Howbeit we know that this man, where he is, when Christ comes, no man knoweth where he is, where he comes from. Then Jesus cried in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know where I came from. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true. That means he is real, whom you do not know. He's telling them that they don't know God. But I know him. For I am from him, and he has sent me. Okay, when he says he's from the Father, and the Father sent him, he's just now confessed that he's a Messiah. He's telling them that. And this is six months before the Passover when he is going to be offered up as the sacrifice. So he doesn't have a lot of time left. The time is now. Going back to verse 27, when they say they know who this man is, they knew his parents, Mary and mm -hmm. supposedly Joseph. They knew that he was from Galilee. They knew his brothers and his sisters. He had sisters as well. And they thought they knew where he was born, but they didn't. You know, they're saying no man's going to know where he comes from, but we know where he came from. Okay, now I'm at verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. No man could lay hands on him. No one could touch him. That would happen at the next feast, at Passover. God would allow them to take him. Jesus would allow them to take him. But until God puts his stamp of approval, it's just not happening. I don't know what happened if they changed their mind or they couldn't get through the crowd. But God made it impossible for them to take him. And many of the people believed on him and said, Hey, when Christ comes... 
will he do more miracles than what this man has done? They're saying, how could Christ do any more than what this man has done? So his miracles were signs of where he came from because nobody could do them. Okay, verse 32. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning Christ. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So they're going to act right now. When they start seeing the people turning toward him saying, hey, this must be the Christ. They sent officers, probably with swords, to go and grab him and bring him back to the chief priests and the Pharisees. Then said Jesus unto them, he was probably speaking to the whole crowd, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, there ye cannot come. So he's speaking once again about a little while. You've got six months, people. That's what he's saying. And you've got me here right now. Listen to me. He's saying, I'm going to leave. But what that leaving means is he's going to die, he's going to resurrect, and he's going to ascend. And they're not going to be able to find him. They may think then, hey, I'd like to see this Jesus now. I think I'd, I might believe him if I heard him one more time. No. He's telling these people. Because we got to remember at the feast, all the Jews were gathered, right? It was the law. So he's got this huge amount of people that he's speaking to that he'll probably never speak to that group again. That's the last time they're going to hear him. After they get done with this feast, they're going to all go to their homes, some up in Galilee and all, all over the place. And a lot of those people are never going to hear him again. So that's why it says, he cried to them saying, that means he was speaking loudly and seriously and positively. Then the Jews said among themselves, where is he going to go? Okay, once again, they don't know what he's saying. <laughs> they, they couldn't comprehend it. Where's he going to go that we can't find him? Will he go into the dispersed? That means the dispersed Jews among the Gentiles, which means the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? Is he going to go there and then he thinks that we won't find him? What manner of saying is this that he said? Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, there you cannot come. They're stumped by that. Okay, so what's coming up here next is the last day of the feast. And on the last day of the feast, they poured out a double portion of water. you got to remember this is going to have something to do with what Christ is going to say. So they were pouring out this double portion of water when Christ speaks. And this is what he says. It said he cried. That means he's pleading with these people. If any man thirst, see they're pouring out the water and then he's talking about the kind of thirst that you have in your soul. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, meaning his heart, shall flow rivers of living water. He was speaking actually of the Holy Spirit. In verse 39 it says, that after he ascended to heaven, he would ask God to send the Holy Spirit, and that would happen on the day of Pentecost. But at this point in time, also, when they were pouring out that water, the people would sing another song. You know, they were singing the halal that we talked about. Well, here's another song that they sang. They just sang scripture. And this is really a neat one. It's Isaiah 12. Two through six. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Now here's the key verse. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. So the people would sing this as they were pouring out the water. And as they're pouring out the water, Jesus is saying, Come to me, all ye that thirst. Because water, like I told you last week, water and bread, they're essential to human life. And the water that he can give is essential to eternal life. Many of the people, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. And 
remember when I had read before in Deuteronomy where it said, out of your brethren, I will raise up a prophet like unto you that was Moses, and he will speak the words that I put into his mouth. That's what they're talking about. That was another prophecy of Jesus. And others said, this is a Christ. But some said, once again, shall Christ come out of Galilee? You know, where he says up in verse 38, that he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, that means out of his heart, shall flow rivers of living water. So it's like Moses struck the rock in the wilderness and it was a thirsty land and they were thirsty. That's what it's like when Jesus comes in your heart. It struck and that living water pours out. And that's part of your salvation. It says it right here. Not only do you get that eternal life, you automatically pour that out to other people and invite them to also have that, that gift of eternal life. Then in verse 42, Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among some of the people because of him. Well, he did come out of Bethlehem. And he was of the seed of David. And people, even today, people are still divided over him, right? Yeah. It, nobody's neutral on Christ. Even if they think they are, they're against him. <laughs> he says, if you're not for me, you're against me. Yes. Okay, verse 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Once again. Okay, now we're coming back on verse 45 to these officers that they sent out to get Jesus. In verse 45, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and the Pharisees said unto them, Why didn't she bring him? That's what they sent him to do. And I love what the officers answered them in verse 46. Wow. They are being a witness for Jesus. They said, never a man spake like this man. Because they heard God speaking. And they were sent to, like, arrest him. And they're thinking, wow, this man's great. He's showing us the secret truths. He's showing us how to have eternal life. And we're supposed to arrest him? No. So, yeah, then answered the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? So in other words, the Pharisees' idea that anyone who believes in Christ is obviously deceived because he's a deceiver, which we all know who the real deceiver is. Mm -hmm. The devil. devil. Mm -hmm. That's what they're calling him. He's a deceiver. That's what they're saying. Then verse 48. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Now they're getting a little concerned. Hey, these officers just got convinced. I hope none of our people are. And this is what he says about the crowd who's there. And a lot of them are from Galilee who had seen a lot of Christ's miracles. In verse 49, the um, Pharisees say, But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Okay, the word that they use for people is like these country bumpkin idiots who <laughs> don't live in Jerusalem and don't know the law as well as we do. When it says that they are cursed, actually that's true. But what the Pharisees don't know is they're cursed too. Mm -hmm. Anyone who lives by the law will suffer from the curse of the law. The law brings death. The spirit brings life. So it's so ironic that they're saying that this crowd is, is cursed because they're not keeping the law good enough. Well, nobody can. So everyone's cursed under the law. So it's, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> Here's something really wonderful that happens. Remember when Nicodemus came to Christ by night? He speaks up right here. 
in verse 50. Mm -hmm. And Nicodemus said unto them, this was he that came to Jesus by night, mm -hmm. being one of the Pharisees, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Now this is really interesting that he brings this up because what he is telling them now, they're just making this big deal about how they keep the law and all these other people don't. This is the law. He's telling them the law. Doesn't our law say that you have to bring a man, you know, like before a court and hear him and know what he's doing? So he's telling them, you need to follow your law or God's law. And you know what they say to him in verse 52? Are you also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. Let me tell you something. Okay, we all know that he, he, he didn't come from Galilee. I mean, he came from Bethlehem. But they're even wrong about that because there were prophets from Galilee. Jonah was from Gath Heifer in Galilee. Nahum was from Elkosh, which may have been Capernaum, which means village of Nahum. Capernaum means village of Nahum, which is in Galilee. Hosea is believed to have been from Galilee. So they don't even know their own history. They're saying no prophet would come out of Galilee, but actually there were some that did and <laughs> but of course Jesus did not so we're getting near the end here and this is really I read this a long time ago and it, it kind of broke my heart because it says and every man went unto his own house so the feast was ending they all went home now I want you to read verse 1 of chapter 8 chapter 8 yeah Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. There's no break between those two. This is all one letter, okay? So everyone else went to their house. Did anyone ask Jesus to come? Say, you can stay at my house tonight. No, he went out into the Mount of Olives alone. Jesus was homeless. Did you realize that? He was a homeless person. It says, fox have, have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And not one of those people at the feast said, you, hey, come stay with me. So he went out, just think about alone, cold, whatever, sleeping on the ground. That, that's the way it went down. So next week we'll start chapter 8. Does anyone have any questions? Have a good week.